I am Bridget Lake, president of the Oviedo Winter Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thank you everyone for coming today to our legislative session wrap up, our monthly luncheon uh, presented by Gray Robinson and sponsored by Orlando Health South Seminole Hospital. This has been amazing. This is, we do daily Zoom meetings at the Oviedo Winter Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce. If you are not aware of them, please go to ovidowinterspringsorg check them out, register for them. I know that we have the college update starting tomorrow, Friday, and we have Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy coming in on Monday. Lots of other updates coming in. I know some of you are still coming into the meeting right now, so Right now we have our legislative slash legislative wrap up session from Gray Robinson. First, I would like to um, thank everyone for attending. We will be asking everyone to type your questions into the chat box that you guys have. If you could type your questions in the chat box, we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Make sure that if there's a specific person you're asking, and it may be a little bit confusing because we have two Chris's here today. So there's Chris Dawson, there's Chris Carmody, Chris Carson, sorry, Chris Carmody, Chris Dawson, both of them. So don't confuse the Chris's too much, um, but Let's make sure that if you have any questions regarding this legislative session wrap up, that you put them in the Q&A chat box. I will be asking them at the end of this. Now, before we start this, I want to recognize our doctors, nurses, first responders, and all of our medical professionals out there that are helping others and saving lives. Thank you. And now at the Oviedo Winter Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce, we have a lot of our trustees that I would like to recognize. We have A Budget Tree Service, Advent Health, Citizens Bank of Florida, City of Oviedo, City of Winter Springs, Duke Energy, Eclat Law, Fairwinds Credit Union, Modern Plumbing, Orlando Health, Oviedo City Church, Oviedo Mall, Oviedo Medical Center, Palm Tree Tech Center. We'd also like to recognize our partners in progress, 419 Metal and Auto Recycling and Platinum Signs and Design. And I'd also like to recognize our media partners, Falconics, Gizmo Productions, El Media, Look Local Magazine, Orlando Business Journal, Oviedo TV, Sakoto Films, and Oviedo Winter Springs Life Magazine. And our friends of the chamber, we have CareSpot Urgent Care Orlando Health, Cavallari Gourmet, Collins Dental, District Eat and Play, Edwards Financial Services, The I Avenue, Fast Signs of Orlando, Insight Credit Union, ITI Engineering, Jean Arthur Associates, James Evans, The Real Estate Celt, Kilgore Perlman, Legends of Winter Springs, Mid Florida Cancer Centers, Orlando Health, Physical, Physician Associates, Orlando Sanford International Airport, Oviedo Brewing, Oviedo YMCA, Partica Group, NAI Real Vest, Pedago Oviedo, Rock and Brews Oviedo, Seminole County Tax Collector Joel Greenberg, Seminole County Property Appraiser David Johnson, Seminole State College, Surf Pro Oviedo Winter Springs, The Real Estate Boulevard, Tuskwilla Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, University of Central Florida, UPS Store 3457, Verizon Wireless, and Vita's Healthcare. Thank you to all of our trustees, partners, friends, and media partners for supporting the Chamber. We are a source for your business needs. We are always here for you. So if you need us, please make sure that you're reaching out. Make sure that you're connecting with us. And if you have any questions, especially during this COVID-19 crisis, uh, make sure that you uh, are checking into our daily meetings that we have scheduled. Now, moving on, I first, before I go into anything, I want to thank my team. If you don't know about the Oviedo Winter Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce, you may not know that we are a very small but mighty team. It is me, Paul West, Melissa Cilio, and Jordan Hook. 
We have been able to, since the COVID-19 crisis has come in, pivot very quickly to make sure that we are a resource for our businesses. And that is essential right now when we are going through everything that we're going through. So just know that we just developed a new COVID-19 tab on our website, ovidowintersprings.org. And this COVID-19 tab has our resources page. It has our webinars that we've recorded. It also has our resources as far as, far as with us being such a small team, we have the Florida Chamber on there. We have the US Chamber. We have the Orlando Economic Partnership on there. We have other places that, that are able to provide connections and opportunities and resources. We understand that you guys have questions and we're here for you. So if, also I wanna mention, if you're interested in sponsoring any of our events or any of these webinars, please contact business at ovidowintersprings.org. Now, I would like to thank our sponsor for today. We have Megan Omasi. She is the Community Relations Manager at Orlando Health South Seminole Hospital. Megan, can we get your remarks for today? Are you here? Make sure to unmute yourself. Okay. I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> Hi everyone, again, Megan Almasi from Orlando Health here. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say hello and I hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy during this time. And today, you know, I know that there's a lot on our mind and we're getting ready to hear what was going on um, up in Tallahassee this year, but I would really like to give you the words of our hospital president, Sean Molesberger, who unfortunately couldn't be here today due to everything happening at the hospital, but I wanted to share his words in a letter that he wrote to our Seminole County neighbors. So Sean says, during these difficult times, uncertainty can cause added stress and uneasiness. Please know that Orlando Health South Seminole Hospital is here with you and for you. As we continue our COVID-19 preparedness efforts, the safety and well-being of your family and our care teams continue to be our top priorities. Our teams are expertly trained and dedicated to serving you. Regardless of your medical needs, whether it's surgery, cardiac care, or emergency services, you can have confidence knowing that we are prepared to provide the same great care that you have come to expect from us. We also understand that as the threats of COVID-19 evolve, so do your needs. Orlando Health offers virtual visit options, whether you're connected with, or whether you're concerned that you may have an ear infection, the flu, or COVID-19. Board certified doctors are a click away via your smartphone, tablet, or laptop. Simply go to orlandohealth.com slash virtual visit. Orlando Health also stands ready to care for COVID-19 patients with severe symptoms. Our experts in infectious diseases and emergency management are well informed about this new coronavirus disease. They are prepared to respond quickly and appropriately for the most severe cases. We also remain in contact with public health officials at the national, state, and local levels, as well as with our media partners to ensure that the proper protocols are in place at all times. We have more than 500 inpatient beds, including those in intensive care units, available at our network of hospitals across Central Florida. To keep our patients, visitors, and care teams safe, we have made changes to our visitation policies. For the latest visitation policies, as well as COVID-19 information and FAQs, visit orlandohealth.com slash COVID-19 or call our COVID-19 hotline at 877-321-COVID. These are times that require courage, clarity, and calm. You can lean on us for strength. Together, we will make a difference in the lives of our community. So thank you all again for the time. We're truly grateful to be partners of the Avito Winter Springs Chamber of Commerce and just so impressed with how they have been able to pivot at such a critical time and still get the information necessary out to all of us. So thank you, and again, please stay well. Thank you, Megan, really appreciate that. I know it's very different saying sponsor remarks on a uh, Zoom meeting compared to in, in live, in an audience. It's, it's definitely something that you have to get used to. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you to Orlando Health South Seminole Hospital for sponsoring today's uh, 
event. And if you are interested in sponsoring, as I said, please reach out to business at ovitawintersprings.org. Now, before I get further, let us go into Gray Robinson is presenting today. I would like to introduce our speakers. As I was saying, there's two Chris's, Chris Carmody and Chris Dawson, so do not get them confused. Uh, we have Chris Carmody, shareholder at Gray Robinson. Chris earned his certification as a designated professional lobbyist from the Florida Association of Professional Lobbyists. He has substantial experience handling governmental relation matters, purchasing and procurement appeals, and professional licensing. Chris also practices in litigation, land use, construction, and sports law. He provides legal work to the Central Florida Sports Commission and handles matters such as tax exemptions, workers' compensation, and other matters that affect sports franchises. Christopher Dawson, shareholder, governmental consultant at Gray Robinson, Chris is an attorney and professional lobbyist in the firm's Orlando office, licensed to practice law in both Florida and Alabama. He primarily focuses on lobbying and governmental relations for public and private sector clients. He is credentialed as a designated professional lobbyist by the Florida Association of Professional Lobbyists. Chris also holds two degrees in civil engineering and has experience in construction litigation and design professional malpractice defense. And we have Robert Stewart Jr. Thank you for not being another Chris, the Senior Government Affairs Consultant at Gray's Robinson. Uh, Gray, sorry, Gray Robinson. Robert began his career as a legislative aide to the Florida House of Representatives. 12 years later at Gray Robinson, Robert is a Senior Government Affairs Consultant and has a leadership role with, within the practice. He has experience in the areas of economic development, education, finance and tax, transportation, insurance, alcohol, and local government issues. Robert's lobbying experience includes representing public sector clients who range from law enforcement to Fortune 500 companies. And now, let me pass it on to the Gray Robinson team for the legislative session update for 2020. Thank you guys so much. And let's Bridget, make sure you thank you so much for having us. Uh, sorry, I had to unmute my line there. I want to make sure. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Chris Carmody, one of the two Chris's you'll see today. And uh, you're looking live from the home office, also the home gym the place where we store all the packages that as we wait for them to be clean. Good times these days. Um, as you'll see on the screen being shared here, uh, we went with a March Madness theme. Um, we, we actually came up with this theme over a month ago before we knew that sports was going to be missing, and we decided to stick with it because, well, this team at least definitely misses sports, and we imagine a lot of you are missing sports. So we'll try to bear with that. Uh, we'll, and as you'll see the kind of blocks in front of you, top seeds, favorites, one shiny moment, you can see where the theme is going. But before we stall that, uh, legislative session is done and over. The governor is already starting to sign le pieces of legislation. You'll see some of that um, as we cover it. But you can't talk about this legislative session without talking about COVID-19 and the impacts it had on it. And so what I'll say is, is while we have time for questions, this will focus really on legislative session 2020, not so much on COVID-19, but as like most of you, We've been tracking it, assisting our clients with SBA loans, amongst other things, assisting our local governments with getting direct funding, and it will have an effect going forward, and we'll get to that. So I wanted to set, this, set the stage on that as we move into this, uh, because it, it, you can't, just like the Parkland session, you can't not think of that session without this. You won't be able to think of this session without COVID-19, especially since they moved a lot of the money around in the budget for that. But let's get started right into that, and like any March Madness theme, any tournament, you have your top seeds, and I'm going to kick it over to Robert Stewart to talk about who the players were in this 2020 legislative session, if you will, the top seeds that had the most influence over the process. Thank you, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be with you. Thanks for uh, allowing us to continue forward with this presentation, even, uh, even though remote. Uh, excited to share what, what our perspective is on 
uh, the session and then, of course, answer any questions that you guys have. But like Chris said, we'll start with the top seeds. Most of the faces that you'll see over these next several slides are ones that are familiar to you, particularly if you follow Florida politics uh, in any given session. Uh, there are, uh, at any given uh, point in Florida politics, there are three critical players, uh, and that is the governor, the speaker, uh, and the Senate president. Um, add to that uh, on, uh, on the executive side is the lieutenant governor, a former legislator herself, uh, Jeanette Nunez, uh, was and will continue to be, I think, uh, one of the most active, politically engaged, um, important lieutenant governors, at least in modern history, uh, for Florida. She uh, carried much of the governor's water in terms of legislative priorities this session. She'll continue to do that. Her relationships inside the legislature and particularly the House are very strong as a former House member. Uh, and I think you'll see her continue to play a major role more than a lot of her predecessors. Continuing in the executive uh, side of government, you have the three statewide elected members of the cabinet, uh, Attorney General Ashley Moody, uh, Chief Financial Officer Jimmy Petronas, and of course Nikki Freed, uh, who also is the only statewide elected Democrat uh, throughout Florida. On the House side, you have the speaker designate. Uh, in any, uh, particularly in the second year of a speakership, uh, that is really when the speaker designate begins to uh, ascend into leadership. Uh, so Chris Sprouse, as both rules chair and speaker designate, uh, wielded quite a bit of influence this session uh, in the House. Um, other key leaders in the House include uh, the speaker pro tem, uh, Marilyn Magar also this year was the, in the last two years, has been the Appropriations Subcommittee Chair for Health and Human Services, the largest section of the budget. Uh, Dane Eagle, Majority Leader, now a candidate for Congress down in Fort Myers. Uh, the Speaker Designate after uh, Chris Sprouse is Paul Renner. Uh, and then, of course, the Appropriations Chair, um, Travis uh, Cummings. Um, more House members, just to, to, to know, many of these faces may be familiar to you. The one closest to our region uh, or for, for those of us on the phone, I'll, I'll mention Mike LaRosa from Osceola County, um, Chair of Commerce, basically anything business related uh, flowed through his committee. Uh, and, and you also have there uh, other uh, policy chairs and the House Minority Leader, Keone McGee. On the Senate side, more important faces, and, and the one that I will highlight for you is, is your local Senator, uh, President Pro Tem David Simmons, finishing up uh, an incredible legislative career uh, and, uh, and riding off into the sunset, as they say. Um, and then, of course, uh, also, uh, I'll note there the, the next two Senate presidents, uh, President-designate Wilton Simpson, he'll serve alongside Chris Sprouse, and then the current majority leader, uh, Kathleen Pasadomo, she'll serve alongside uh, Paul Renner when, when he ascends into leadership. Uh, and, and like with top seeds in a, uh, in a NCAA tournament, there are favorites, uh, and these are the issues that we'll run through here, uh, which were uh, sort of forecasted before session, things that you knew were gonna be talked about and, and where they ended up. So Chris Dawson. Absolutely, thank you, Robert. And uh, we'll jump right in on these priorities. Uh, the first three that I'm gonna cover really were uh, the, the backbone of the governor's legislative uh, agenda for this year. And so we'll jump in. Uh, first, he started with teacher pay raises, and you may recall in January, uh, he publicly made a call to make this session of the teacher, uh, looking to uh, both grow and expand the public education workforce, recruit more teachers. And so for that purpose, he really focused on the starting salary. Um, the governor initially put forward a $900 million proposal. $600 million of that would have been dedicated to raising that teacher salary, starting teacher salary to $47,500. And then there was a $300 million bonus program that was to be used to reward veteran teachers and administrators. Uh, of course, there's always compromise in Tallahassee and there are only so many state dollars that have to be spread over a bunch of priorities. So the legislature uh, ultimately passed a pared down version of the teacher pay raise proposal. Uh, they allallocated five hundred million dollars four hundred million of that is set aside to get that starting salary up to the forty seven thousand five hundred dollars so that is now the floor in Florida for starting teacher salaries and then an additional hundred million dollars of that funding will go to veteran teacher uh, compensation uh, moving on e verify a, a major issue for the governor and also a major issue for business interests across the state uh, candidate DeSantis put forward a two-pronged uh, immigration platform, and of course he won, and, and as our governor, uh, he has had success on the first prong of that. That was the Sanctuary Cities bill that passed the legislature 
last year. Uh, this year, he came back to uh, fulfill the second part of his immigration plan, which focuses on the mandatory use of E-Verify. Uh, ultimately, the legislature did pass this priority. Uh, it requires all public and private sectors employers, uh, sector employers in Florida to use some form of immigration verification, uh, employee verification uh, system. They may either choose the federal E-Verify system, which you've heard a lot about in the news, or they may use the more uh, normal standardized I-9 form process. Uh, it's important to note here there were some provisions uh, that carried through in this bill uh, that were a little bit of concern to many in the business community, particularly one that would have allowed the Department of Econ Economic Opportunity to audit for compliance. Uh, that was ultimately not included in the package. Lastly, we'll talk about deregulation. Uh, this, again, a top priority of the governor and his Department of Business and Professional Regulation that is headed up by Secretary Halsey Bashirs, uh, a former member of the Florida House. And this is really an effort that's been in the making since the governor ascended to, uh, to the governor's mansion in Tallahassee. Uh, he has held a, about as many deregathons at the executive level as you can, uh, getting his agencies to cut red tape, but he needed the legislature to help in, in order to really take a holistic approach to deregulation of occupational licensure. And so that's what this bill does. It is an omnibus bill. It covers many different forms of uh, regulation over licensure from, uh, you know, licensure to out of out-of-state contractors to whether or not interior designers have to be licensed at all. Uh, it also reduces and streamlines hours for required training and continuing education for specific licenses. For those of you in the construction and, and building world, it also revises the membership of the Florida Building Commission. Uh, most of the seats that are eliminated there were public sector seats. And sector seats. Uh, most of the construction trades and interest groups are still represented on that commission. Uh, and, and so there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, the department will be spending several months unpacking this and really putting, uh, putting these you know, legislative changes into action into the real world. And with that, I'll hand it over to Carmody to keep going on our favorites issue. And thank you. Okay, so I, I one note though, as I saw Robert going through the slides with this with the top seeds, <clears throat> and you see those basketball silhouettes next to them. Robert and I used to play in the basketball lobbyist legislator league, and I can assure you, none of them actually play good basketball. Randy Bracy out of Orange County, who wasn't on the slides, he actually can dunk a basketball, but none of them can. So let's jump into water quality, quantity spending. Um, since the governor uh, took his oath of office almost two years ago, water quality and quantity has been something that's been foremost on his mind. He put a, a charge out there for $2.5 billion over four years. Last year, the legislature got a quarter of the way there. Uh, this year, they did again. They got about $620, $630 million towards water funding, which will, which will cover any number of things. Springs Restoration, Lake Okeechobee, Septic Sewer. There's a lot of pockets of dollars there that they go into. And then you'll see in the second bullet, Senate Bill 712, the Clean Waterways Act. Uh, a lot of how I'd sum this up is it got rid of a lot of the red tape, which hopefully at, once it goes into effect and we have the next fiscal year, this will uh, speed up the uh, moving of on-site sewage programs, directing the water management to have consolidated reports to APAGA and remove the statutory language that requires certain on-site uh, sewage treatment and disposal system to be approved by Department of Health and it can just go right away. The Department of Health angle is interesting because when you think of sewage and septic, you think of Department of Environmental Protection, not DOH, but the Department of Health has had this under their silo for a while. And, and a lot of folks have viewed them as being in the way of innovative ways of doing better septic um, upgrades. So this will hopefully spur that along. Another one of the favorites uh, moving that we knew would move through session was healthcare reform. And that was a speaker priority. We'll get to some of those later, but uh, expanding scope of practice for registered nurses and pharmacists was a major priority of the speaker, and no surprise there, it was moving fast through the session, and then the late negotiations with the Senate, it was able to get to the, the uh, finish line. Who was opposed to that? The doctors in the Florida Medical Association, they viewed any kind of expansion of practice for whether it's pharmacists to, to, um, to diagnose strep throat or flu, or whether it's nurses to diagnose any number of maladies, it would, it would recede away from their earned privileges as a doctor after four years of med school, residency, um, if you will, and probably other trainings, uh, it would erode that away. 
and just in general health concerns of should the people who don't have that medical background be making these diagnoses. Ultimately, the speaker got his way and those passed and were signed by the governor. And we'll talk a little bit about those later. One more favorite um, were the tax cuts. And this, actually, this was actually sent to the governor yesterday and signed by the governor yesterday. Now this package about a month ago before session ended was pretty large, it was over 100 million, about 100 million in impact. It was gonna reduce the business rent tax. It was gonna reduce the communication services tax aka what's on your cell phone and cable bills, also was going to reduce um, the, it was going to provide the hurricane preparedness and the back to school holiday. Those both stayed in the hurricane preparedness and the sales tax holiday, but because of COVID-19 and the expected impacts on that, pretty much everything else that was a big ticket item was removed. Um, so the package, it was there, it puts a lot of things in place from policy and gives some flexibility. For example, when you're challenging your property tax, um, bill, which I imagine a lot of folks are going to be doing this year, given the circumstances that it, it's kind of puts in there how you actually go about doing that and streamline some of those. But it was much more dialed back than what it was <laughs> tax reduction, no communication services tax. Now I'm going to turn it over to Robert to talk a few of the other uh, priorities um, that were favorites this session. But yeah, visit Florida. Uh, I'll, I'll pick up right there, and and we'll continue. Um, as Chris was saying, Visit Florida, the big, the big question coming into the session was would um, Visit Florida survive the session or not? Um, ultimately, it did, which is great news, uh, including a three-year extension. The governor received that bill uh, yesterday, signed it yesterday. Great news for Visit Florida. Great news for uh, our communities that rely so heavily on tourism. Uh, and, um, and we're looking forward to that being in place for at least another three years and likely well beyond. Another favorite uh, as we went into the legislative session was college athlete compensation. Florida, uh, following the lead of all places, California, in pushing legislation that would allow college athletes to profit off of their name, image, and likeness. Um, and that bill uh, did pass. Uh, the governor is expected to sign it. Uh, the governor was one of the major um, uh, advocates for this going into the legislative session. It was a top priority of his. The one, the one change that was made at the very end, the House's version of the bill had this effective July 1, 2020. Uh, they bumped that back a year to give the NCAA time to work with all the member states uh, and member institutions to find uh, rules or to develop rules that can implement this. Uh, and so uh, Florida, other states are looking at this, Ohio, Michigan, others uh, with major uh, college sports programs. So do expect the NCAA to, to, to move things at least just a bit in that regard. Um, moving right along to, uh, to one shining moment, those of you who, are, who follow uh, the NCAA tournament uh, know that at the end of every tournament, there is a, uh, there is a very uh, traditional and, and special time where Luther Vandross gets on the screen and sings one shining moment uh, to celebrate the, that year's champion. Uh, and you really can't have an NCAA tournament without that moment. Um, well, like that, um, with uh, the way uh, the session works, you really cannot have uh, a successful session without passing a budget. It's the only thing the legislature is constitutionally required to do. Uh, and so they did that this year. It did take an, a couple extra days. Uh, but before we talk about what's in the budget, uh, let's remind you guys of the greatest one shining moment. And hopefully this video will work. from 2007 when our beloved Gators uh, brought home their second straight national title. Despite tonight's loss, it was stored the glory to Ohio State basketball. For Clark, for Seth, for Those were good days, and I was there for that one. That one was fun. Um, and you can, uh, Chris, you can make a m moving right along, and, uh, and, and for those of you who, uh, who are, are also Gators, you can relive that with us. Um, Chris Dawson, you want to tell us what was actually in the budget? Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. And, and as Robert said, uh, the, the legislature has one constitutional mandate every year, and that is to pass a, bullet, uh, a state budget. And on top of that, that budget has to be a balanced budget. We do not have deficit spending in the state, uh, like you see at the federal level. So the, uh, the, the, uh, all of the uh, numbers have to come out to an even and balanced budget for the year. Uh, so this year for the 2020-2021 state fiscal year, we will have a $93.2 billion state budget. Uh, that is a record budget, highest in the state's history. Uh, now, of course, 
COVID-19 could play a, a role in how that budget actually unfolds when we get into the next fiscal year for the state. Uh, but there will be more uh, more on that determined later this summer. The legislature may have to uh, go into a special session to do some of that tweaking work and also to allocate federal funds that will be coming down for COVID-19 response. But this is the state budget as it breaks down. You can see the largest proportion of our state budget is health and human services at $39.4 billion. Uh, quickly after that is the K-12 system. And then you get into some of the smaller pieces of the budget, but notably I would point out uh, the red slice, the transportation economic development slice, that includes the state's uh, Department of Transportation work plan, which is uh, again fully funded this year. So roads, bridges, airports, ports across the state, uh, that infrastructure spending was included and is expected to keep going uh, at the breakneck speed we've had here in Florida lately. Uh, and so this is the current budget and, and we'll see how things shake out here in the next couple months when we get some revenue projections on, on what the economic fallout might be from COVID-19. So as I said earlier, Speaker Oliva, his last two years has been focused on healthcare. Last year it was, it, some of our sponsors know as part of this group, it was focused on hospitals and, and think of, I always say, think of capital complexes, the, the, the buildings that do the healthcare. This session it was been much more focused on those who are actually acting in healthcare, the doctors, the pharmacists, the nurses. Uh, of, of those bills, both uh, pharmacists had expanded uh, scope of practice. They can now, once, once this goes fully in effect, um, diagnose strep or the flu with a test. And then if they, and prescribe accordingly, if the symptoms persist, uh, they're, they're required to recommend those folks to a doctor and encourage that transition over because the doctor would obviously help them assess the maladies. Same thing with registered nurse. Their scope of practice is expanded to the point where they don't need doctors for certain um, diagnoses and treatments on maladies. Obviously, the doctors pushed hard against this. It got personal at times and feisty. Um, things were said over Twitter and in the public and committee meetings, but ultimately these bills passed and the governor signed. Another one that was controversial, but from the lobby corps we knew was, was going to happen regardless of where your beliefs were, was the parental consent for abortion bill. Um, and the governor uh, signed that. The, what we expect is it will be challenged within weeks or months from now. Uh, that is certainly a bill that um, drew its own share of controversy and, and there you have it. Uh, growth management was another uh, chalk, we call it chalk because it was definitely getting the, 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 the scales moved in its favor on the House and Senate side. And this is in the last two years we've seen this trend where the House and Senate tried to look at growth management um, priorities and, and requirements at the local level and implement better ones. You'll see a lot of bullets there. What I'll get to is some of the meat of it, um, some of which, which requires you to take in property rights on your comprehensive plan. Um, and then in the decision-making process and, they, and local governments have to adopt this element um, by or before July 1, 2023. Um, some other things dealing with county charter provisions or comp plans um, that you have to, you can't limit what municipalities can do within their own jurisdictions. Where this will get interesting is if a, if a city a municipality annexes a part of unincorporated counties, uh, then they can make those into um, neighborhoods or do anything they want with them, even if they say, let's just say they were in a rural land boundary area. Um, Seminole County is familiar with some of those debates. These are, this legislation hasn't been signed. The governor hasn't seen it yet, but these are some of the things that went in there. As well, there's been other, other parts of this, this legislation and some of the other legislation that dealt with affordable housing, restricting linkage fees if you're going to require affordable housing. And if you do have them, you have to fully offset those linkage fees for developers and as well trying to speed up the permit process. Um, it, there is, like I said, there's, you count it, there's six bullets there and you can probably add 10 more. If you have any specific questions, we can get into those later on. And then of course, everyone's favorite piece of legislation, we're gonna let Robert take the lead on license plates. Yeah, so for about the last 10 years, the legislature has tried to pass a comprehensive specialty license plate bill um, that would both create a new regulatory framework for how plates come about and also uh, add some new plates that have long been sought by particular members of the House and Senate. Uh, this bill gets filed every single year and it dies at the very end every single year, uh, but they finally got it done. Um, so uh, the new tags that you'll begin to see out on the roadways include uh, things like Give Kids the World, a local uh, favorite here in Central Florida, out-of-state universities like Auburn, Georgia, Alabama um, will, will begin to be on the roadways. The Divine Nine for the historically black um, African-American um, sororities and fraternities are in there. Uh, and also what it'll do is cap all specialty plates at 150. Right now there's 
uh, there's about 100 and I think it's like 44. This will cap at 150, the number that can be on the roadways. And as, um, uh, as plates uh, begin to not sell as well, so if you don't sell 3,000 in a given year, your plate is taken out of circulation and a new one is rotated in, uh, keeping that cap at 150. So that's something to keep an eye on. Just an interesting bill that everybody's got their plate that they care about, uh, and they were finally able to get this one done. Uh, another recurring issue every single session is preemption issues, the state preempting local governments on certain things. And all things being equal, local governments had a pretty good session uh, on the preemption front. Uh, you'll see that things like vacation rail preemption died, local occupational license died, uh, building design changes died. Uh, two things that, that passed, uh, that, and one of which local governments were very much in support of, was the continuing services contracts increased. The, the amount of money, the amount of the projects they can do under continuing services contracts with their providers was increased from 2 million to 4 million for things like architecture, engineer, construction, uh, and then a reduction in retainage as well was one that the local governments didn't love. Uh, retainage is the amount of money they can hold back uh, on performance or on payments to local, uh, to, to contractors on construction projects. That was reduced from a 10% hold to a 5% hold. Um, and then of course, a big one for local governments was uh, communication services tax reduction and reform. Uh, that uh, also failed, uh, which was a win for local governments. And then in any, in any NCAA tournament, there are Cinderella stories. There are teams that, uh, that make it way out of the, of the rounds that they're supposed to, making big upsets, and this year was no different. There were issues that were not expected at all, but took up quite a bit of time, and so we'll, we'll get into some of those now. Chris, you with us? Yeah, I think Chris he's Austin, muted, so I'll, I'll tee off until he gets going there. Oh, there there you go. go Sorry, guys. Um, yes, so it, as Robert mentioned, you know, your Cinderella stories, these are the things that really kind of come out of nowhere but, but drive uh, the direction of the tournament. And we did have some issues this year that came out of seemingly nowhere and really drove some of the discourse during the legislative session. The first, uh, unfortunately, a sad one for our state, uh, a little bit of impropriety and in, in some expenditure uh, or expenditure of state funds. And you probably saw some of the news coverage on this. This was really just coming to light uh, towards the middle and end of session. And, and it centers on compensation for the executive director of the uh, Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Uh, through some state auditing, it was discovered that she had collected more than seven and a half million dollars in total compensation. Uh, all, nearly all of it in state funds, just over a couple of years, uh, and there had been uh, some misrepresentation on what her compensation package was. The board of the uh, coalition uh, it, it still is questioning or being questioned on what they knew and, and when they knew it by the legislature. So this is an issue that's not going to go away. Uh, that investigation uh, in itself continues, but also this is one of those situations where you know the action of uh, this entity and, and a couple of folks within it is going to have significant ramifications for nonprofits across the state, uh, and so the ripple effects to this are, are something to watch. Another issue that really came out of nowhere uh, and, and frankly was filed in an overnight amendment. Uh, th this wasn't on anyone's radar until the language dropped uh, late one evening. Was a consolidation of the state university system. Uh, there was a proposal put forward by the Florida House that would have consolidated the system from 12 institutions down to 10, and in doing that, it would have eliminated or more, more correctly folded New College of Florida and Florida Polytechnic University into the larger state flagship universities, University of Florida and FSU. Uh, the plan was not well received in the Senate. Uh, it did catch a lot of folks on fire uh, or uh, uh, by surprise and, and had folks running around on fire. Uh, trying to figure out where this was coming from, whether it was a, a, a real uh, and serious proposal. Uh, it did get a little bit of traction. Notably, both of these institutions have the highest per student uh, cost for a degree, and that was what was driving the narrative. So this probably will continue, maybe in more of a global conversation on what the state pays per degree for, for students in the state university system, but it, uh, it definitely caught folks by surprise. And now, uh, Chris Carmody is going to take over and discuss affordable housing, which has been an issue. Uh, so, of course, affordable housing is something that we've talked about for many sessions here, and, and every session they lead in. Why it's a Cinderella story is because if you polled every lobbyist before session and every legislator and said, do you think that they'll 
more than half fund affordable housing from the Sadowski Trust, I promise no more than 10% would have said yes. The House didn't seem interested in it. Much The Senate certainly was and the governor was. And then as session moved on, uh, you started to see some momentum here. And so you see that slide, it's pretty straightforward, but the 350 million that comes from that trust fund, the legislature fully funded. And then on top of that, um, it was uh, also additional funds, not from that trust fund were allocated to the panhandle to continue to help with Hurricane Michael relief. How will that be allocated? Uh, the, the, this, there's a state aid entity that's a public private um, that actually receives the funds and doles it out county by county um, based on districts. And they have, there's, there's affordable housing providers that apply for those funds. And it's an application process. The joke is everyone scores 100 and they have like 15, 16 tiebreakers beyond that of who gets the funds. So when you, if you're familiar with affordable housing, you've probably seen daycares and some of those, that was something, was a tiebreaker. So I say that to point out that the funds are now in play. You're going to see a lot of folks ramp up applications and try to get those funds into the community. Expect those to really start to hit and, and you see developments to start going up uh, at some time in Q4 um, of this year or early Q1 of 2021. And then as well, constitutional amendment, it's, 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 it's an election year, so it, it seems odd that this would be a Cinderella story, but everyone kind of thought that they were done messing with some of the uh, petition initiatives, but um, they had some additional changes they wanted to do, and this was passed, and I believe signed by the governor yesterday, but it's certainly in his, in his possession. Robert's nodding his head, I can see it's definitely passed. So it, here's what I'll tell you. The main change of, through Senate Bill 1794 is provides a private cause of action for a citizen to challenge the validity of petition gatherers. So if you ever wondered who that person is that put the petition in front of you, if you don't feel comfortable with it, now there's actually a cause of action. Now, what is that really going towards the inside baseball is, is um, a lot of these petition gatherers hire folks to, to gather these signatures, but they all actually have to be registered signature gatherers. And if they're not properly registered, technically those, those petitions are not valid. But there's been no way to really enforce that or challenge that. Well, now this will give a mechanism for them to say, well, did Johnny or Jane outside of the Walmart or the Target, were they really registered and valid? I want to know and I want to find out. And now you can have a private cause of action. The idea is that that was shortened that. Some other things of it is it shortens the timeline of when you can turn over those signatures. And then as well, it, um, it in that last bullet increases the threshold uh, it used to be 10% of your signatures collected to start getting it reviewed in the process and only from a quarter of the congressional districts in the state. By making it 25% and half the congressional districts, that makes it a little harder because the dirty little secret is when you get that threshold 10% and you start going through the attorney general review and obviously then the Supreme Court review of your language, that would give you investments from other parts of the state and internationally for people who care about those issues. Think of the felon voting rights issue. Once their language was approved by the Supreme Court, they got an influx of cash to help them get to the finish line. Now that you got to get to 25% and half of the congressional districts, that's a little harder. And again, makes it just a little more difficult to get something on the ballot. Harder to buy it, if you will. Uh, and finally, um, it, that ones I'll cover is uh, sovereign immunity caps. Um, this was something that really came out of nowhere. It didn't ultimately pass, but we pointed out to you because it's definitely going to come again next year. If you're not familiar, um, every city and county and other state or government entity, they, they have sovereign immunity. So if there's an accident, hopefully it's none of y'all, and you sue the government, um, there's a cap of how much you can collect against that government. Government Currently, it's two hundred dollars or 300000 depending on the cause of action and the type of damages. And if you go anything above that, the state, the legislature and the governor have to approve that additional allocation. That's what they call a claim bill. This process is very hard to get through. Some say that's a good thing, others don't like it, um, but, but nevertheless, it's a complicated system that a lot of folks have issues with. What was proposed this year is taking it from two to 300,000 to a million, that was eventually amended down to 500,000, and it moved a little in the Senate, but never got any headway in the House and a bill was never filed. This was certainly pushed by the trial bar um, for the lawyers that work in that industry. They wanted something that had higher caps, which meant more funding for their clients and for them, quite frankly. I expect it'll be back next year. We've heard the House is going to workshop language over the summer and do some studies on it. This would have an extremely detrimental impact on cities and counties if you look at it from that regard, because their insurance premiums will go up. And then as well, they would have to um, pay more if they had those caps. So it'd be difficult for cities and counties, a win for the trial bar, fully expect it back next year. And then Robert, talk to us about those newspaper ads. Yeah, a few more issues we'll run through and then would love to answer your question. So a, a bill that gets filed every single year and never really gets a lot of traction did get a ton of traction this year, passing the House, 
and almost uh, getting to the floor of the Senate for a, for a, final, uh, for a final vote uh, ultimately fell a little bit short, but it will be back. And that is uh, the legal notices that are required in law to be posted in the local dailies. Um, it's really a newspaper protection act and has been there for a long time. Uh, and there are, uh, not surprisingly, there are members of the legislature that don't get along with their local paper. Uh, there are papers in this, in this state that don't really like the legislature. Uh, and so as those uh, battles sort of rage on in the public space, this is a bill that, uh, that if you were to allow for more online uh, electronic notification of local government action and not have to buy an ad in a paper, that would be very detrimental to the paper, to, to the newspaper industry, but also save local governments a lot of money. So there's a bit of a tug and a pull about uh, policy that would help local governments uh, and, and all government entities for that matter in saving money that are required to post things while also, uh, and, and, and whether or not they want to do that to the newspaper industry. So it's something to keep an eye on. Again, it usually doesn't get much traction, did pass the house this year. Randy Fine from the Brevard County area uh, has been the major uh, proponent of this. Joe Gruders in the Senate sponsored it and, and we do expect it to come back again next year. Uh, this is our favorite topic, uh, booze. Um, and uh, there is uh, every year, or at least for the last several years, there's been an effort to, um, to provide more freedom, less regulation for things like craft breweries, craft distilleries. Uh, and this legislation uh, that, that moved well in the House but got stalled in the Senate, that's a recurring theme that you're probably hearing here, uh, was would have allowed you to bring your dog into a brewery. It would have uh, allowed for uh, craft distilleries to sell drinks by the glass, which currently they don't have that ability. It would have removed the cap on the size of wine uh, that, that you can buy. So today in Florida, you may not know this, there's literally only three sizes of wine that you can buy. Uh, and if you sell or buy in a different size wine, you're, creating, uh, you're, you're committing a crime. Uh, this was a bill that would have uh, removed that wine size. Uh, next year, there will be another bill uh, there's a little bit more political will, there seems like, under the next Senate presidency to, to try to move something like this. So it's something to keep an eye on for all of us who, uh, who like our alcohol and like our freedom. Uh, transportation bill, we, we listed this in the Cinderella stories, not because there's uh, any surprise to a transportation bill. There's one filed every single year. But the fact that it almost passed for the second year in a row uh, was really what made it a Cinderella story. Last year, they were able to pass a transportation bill. Those usually pass every three or four years and they almost got one done this year. A lot of good policy in these bills. Um, uh, Representative Alex Andrade from uh, the Panhandle was the House sponsor. Tom Lee was the Senate sponsor out of Tampa Bay. Uh, we do expect it back next year with a lot of good policy with the Department of Transportation. And then tourist development tax changes. Uh, in the midst of the tax package negotiations that Chris talked about earlier, uh, there was uh, pushed by the House um, by Brian Avila out of Miami significant changes to how the tourist development tax is spent, uh, major expansions in the allowable uses, um, and, uh, and all of that was driven, for the most part, out of concerns that he had in Miami-Dade uh, with his home county. Uh, the Senate was not, uh, uh, was not in the mood to pass any changes to TDT, with one very small tweak made in the law for, for a particular project in Lee County. Otherwise, tourist development tax was left exactly as it is today. Uh, and that was a big win for the tourism industry, uh, particularly in light of, of, of COVID and uh, needing to protect those dollars to market our destination uh, once we're allowed uh, out back in public again. And a couple more and then we'll be all ready for questions. Chris? All right, thank you, Robert. And uh, bringing it in landing, I'll get my shameless pun in here on the airport bill. Uh, this was another measure by Representative Brian Avila out of Miami, also related back to a local issue down in his district. Uh, and for anyone who's flown in and out or uh, in or out of a Florida airport, you know, everything's under construction, business is booming. Uh, there were some perceived uh, issues with transparency in procurement down in Miami at the, uh, at the hub airport, Miami International. And so this, that was the impetus for this bill and, and what it ultimately does is it provides for greater transparency on issues that are coming before airport boards for procurement. It dictates when they have to be pulled out of consent agendas and discussed uh, by the board and voted on separately. There was also a provision in the bill uh, initially that would have required uh, greater forms of financial disclosure uh, by, uh, or by airport uh, board members. Uh, and there were some, some concerns on that because a lot of these board members have been appointed. They've been serving under one set of disclosure rules. And then of course the bill sought to change that. 
Uh, and so that was really a sticking point on this legislation. Um, next, I'm going to discuss uh, school board term limits, uh, an issue that has also uh, been around for a long time. Uh, not a whole lot to say. It's pretty self-explanatory. The, the House particularly has taken up uh, the desire to impose term limits on school board members across the state. The Senate has refused to go along with that position and again this year uh, would not take up that position so this bill died. Uh, but this is a priority that's been uh, recurring in the House and is likely to return again next year. Finally, the, the last uh, Cinderella story issue I'll discuss, um, THC caps for medical marijuana. Many of you, if you've been following with the state's implementation of uh, medical marijuana over the last several years, uh, it has been fraught with challenges and legal issues. Uh, and so this is just the next iteration of that. Uh, and so the legislature, particularly the House, sought to impose a 10% THC cap on medical marijuana products in the state. Uh, ultimately, the Senate was not willing to go along with that position, uh, but this issue is one that is almost certain to return again as well. So as we started, we'll finish. Uh, it, will it be a summer madness here? So, uh, it, you know, we hear a lot of discussion about special session, uh, possibly before July 1, when the budget would go in effect, possibly after. Uh, Senate President Bill Galvano uh, not, last week released a memo that discussed um, what he was thinking and what he was hearing from the feds and funding and, and hinted that there could be a special session, but noted that that special session would likely come after um, the fiscal year starts, sometime after July 1, probably before Labor Day, with the idea of Look, we passed a budget, we had $4 billion in reserves to deal with some of the coronavirus, um, and, and what we're going to do is, is pass it, let the governor do whatever vetoes he needs to do, and then we'll come back and reallocate funds or reassess in the next year. And we have, quite frankly, after July 1, you'll have another round of revenue estimated, estimating conference to come through to actually have a better idea of just what is expected in the Florida tax rolls to help pay for things. Um, what, but part of that, though, it won't just be budget. You'll look at policy as well. Uh, one thing we didn't cover yet uh, was that, that second square there. You see the, the renewed gaming compact. The Seminoles now, this will be the second year in a row that they haven't paid into the state of Florida based on their compact because the state allowed violations of the exclusivity parts of it on Blackjack and a couple other games with pair mutuals. That's about $300 million to the budget that the state is no longer getting. Um, and the New Deal was saying it would be upwards of $500 million, uh, to the state. It, apparently, it got really close. Part of it was online betting and a few other things. But as they come back and the state's looking for funds, they'll probably look at um, the gaming compact as a source of revenue that, quite frankly, isn't all that controversial with most citizens across the state. They, they trust the Seminole tribe is you know, not doing anything nefarious in those locations. The other part of it, too, is, is, is I'm sure as our state shut down um, about three, four weeks ago, we sure wish we had an online sales tax as opposed to a bricks and mortar sales tax. Um, that's been pushed for the last couple of years, largely by those who want to recap the revenue and also those who want to create an even playing field with our brick and mortar retailers, many of you that are probably on this call. Um, it got more momentum than expected this year, and it was almost something that could have been the Cinderella story, but it didn't get to the finish line. I would suspect if they have a special session, they'll look at that because all those Etsy masks that are being sold and all those things, if you don't have a presence in Florida, we're not collecting online sales tax. And, and they estimate it's upwards in the three to 400 million that the state it just today is losing. Now that none of our retail shops are selling anything and everything's going online, that number's probably grown. Uh, and so that kind of segues, and I don't want to step on your toes, Bridget, on questions, but I saw at least a couple in the chat that I'll, I can address right away about how will some of this money be allocated. We started with COVID-19, we'll kind of end with that. The state, based on the CARES Act, is supposed to get anywhere between eight to nine billion of dollars just to them. There's another three to four billion that's going to come toward an education help for our school districts and also hospital health cares and our first responders and prison system, et cetera. But that eight to nine billion was from that 150 billion that was set aside, if you recall, for the states and then um, the Native Americans and DC. 11 million was carved out, 8 billion went to the tribes across the 50 states, which if you do the math, wow, Native Americans did really well in that deal. 3 billion to Washington, D.C. and the islands like uh, territories like Guam, Puerto Rico, and then the other 139 billion to the 50 states, with no state getting less than 1.25 billion. If you can do that math, and don't worry, I've already done it, Florida gets a range of 8 to 9 billion. Now, you probably read something that any counties with 500,000 or more citizens, or cities for that matter, would get their share 
That's, there's some, something about 13, 14 counties that qualify as well as one city, that's Jacksonville, which is a combined Duval Jacksonville. So, and they can get no more than 45% of the state's allocation. So of the eight to nine billion, Florida's gonna get 45%-ish, I say, because I haven't run all those numbers, will go to the counties, including Orange County, um, and Hillsborough, all the South Florida counties, Duval County, and a few others. And then the rest will go to the state. Now that's meant for coronavirus relief. The state, as you've probably read, has spent 241 million, not billion, but million on this. All of our counties and cities are spending lots of money on this as well. But there's been discussion that those funds can both offset for budget stabilization. So some of it will go to unemployment compensation. Florida has a pretty conservative approach on that, and that's being kind. The papers have not been so kind on that. Um, but the feds have certainly supplemented. So that will go to some of it. Some of it will go to the state's efforts, like the field hospitals, the mask is spot, whatever. But a lot of it could end up going to the budget stabilization. If you can take even a couple of those billions on top of the $4 billion Florida had, in theory, they won't have to do anything to Florida's budget. That's in theory. Time will tell. They're looking into that. We're hearing that President Trump, the Treasury, and others are going to allow this to be budget stabilization because they view that as economic development as well. If the state has to cut the pay raises for teachers, has to cut the affordable housing trust fund dollars, has to cut all the special projects, that's just going to have pain points in other areas. So that's kind of a picture of what's next. And then I see one other question that talks about how COVID-19 has dealt with agribusiness and how the legislation may be effective. Well, good news if you're in agriculture. The incoming Senate President Wilton Simpson is an egg farmer from Pasco County, and every year he's pushed for more focus on protecting agribusiness. And if they go with a special session, you're going to see a focus on that. Now, how has it impacted it? Think of anyone in the food industry. It's impacted everyone. Obviously, our publixes and grocers are doing well, and the takeout restaurants, some of them are doing better than others. But it's certainly, I've, I've read articles where the agribusiness says they're just wasting, not wasting intentionally, but food's just going to waste because no one can buy it or can or needs to buy it at the moment because the restaurants don't have a need for it. But that will sort of normalize and pick up, but you can absolutely count on the state to support efforts to help agribusiness. Now I left to come back in. That was my Chris Weber timeout moment because my sound was going poorly. So I don't see all the other questions in the chat, but if Bridget or Robert or Dawson or if any of y'all want to jump in, let me know what other questions we have. So typically I read them down from the chat box and it started with uh, Randy asking about the Sadowski 350 million and how that would be allocated. Did you cover that? Yeah, so I, I saw that question pop up as I was discussing it. So they're, they're, the Florida Housing Finance Corporation is who oversees that. Trey Price, who used to be with the Florida Realtors, runs that organization. So they get their funds. It's, it's, it's kind of complicated, and I don't mean to, to say it, like to, to, to skim away from that, but there's state funds, there's local funds, there's private funds, and it all kind of gets melded together. They, but they do allocations based on region. Orange County is the, the heart of the, this region here, obviously Seminole and Osceola, and you're seeing more and more projects come down to Osceola as well as Seminole. But this, this locals kick in money, you have the state's money comes down, and it's based on region and, and population proportionally, and then the locals buy in. But like I said, there's an application process, and, and the kind of the joke is, is the folks who are applying have all been applying and doing this for decades now. So they, they all score 100, and then there's like 16, 17 tiebreakers of how you dole out the money. But eventually, the money will be doled out it will be filtered out into those communities. But I would say I wouldn't expect those until sometimes Q4 of this year or Q1 2021 to see those projects really start to come up out of the ground. But, but they will come up because this is, that's actually substantial money compared to what's been there before. And there's a lot of projects in waiting. And I noticed you covered agriculture, but we have one about the Senate Bill 410 is on the governor's desk. In addition to allowing the rural boundary to be breached, it would also require all cities and counties to spend a lot of your money to add language to their planning documents that already exist in Florida's constitution. And then it says, so it's pointless, almost a law to create business for consultants. If you think those provisions of that law sound like a bad idea, Oh, she, okay. So call both this number and that number and say you do not want local governments to have rework their comp plans to include language when that language is not, sorry, when that language does nothing but repeat what is already in Florida's constitution. It's a mayor Sladek not holding back. I love it. Our favorite mayor in Seminole County. We're a little yeah. biased. They are our client, but we do love you, Megan. 
Um, also a good law school classmate of mine, smarter than me. So uh, to, to, to address that, Mayor, um, yeah, we've talked about this some, but Senate Bill 410, and you note in the comments, I don't think Bridget hit that yet, but Representative David Smith is already working on beating this. Th these are some of the things we talked about in the growth management. There's been a focus by the legislature last year to tweak some of these things. It's a perception that the locals are, are not doing things right. I think it's a little bit of both in the sense there's always one local government that's not doing things all that well, and then it becomes the tyranny of the anecdote up in Tallahassee where they say, well, if this small town or village or hamlet's doing it wrong, they all must be doing it wrong. We have to change the law, which is obviously data doesn't support that, but here we are. And then amendments show up in the very last week, and a lot of times the amendments, you see it, but you don't necessarily process what it means right away. You see the comment about the rural boundary. I think when, you're, when you initially looked at the language of that one amendment that Mayor Slate was talking about, no one thought rural boundary and concerns over if the city annexes or whatever, and then you can do it, you can breach the rural boundary. And then, of course, as you digest it, when the bill's either already passed or nearly passed, and you go, oh, that's what this could mean. League of Cities, Association Counties, it's like whack-a-mole, and we do our part to assist them on this, um, but some of these slip through. Uh, so Ma Mayor's point's well taken. Some of these bills are not perfect. We love the legislators we work with, but they take something, like I said, that affects really one or two parts of the state. That's a problem, but they apply it to everyone across the 67 counties and over 460 cities. Um, I, I think that answers it, but if not, we can get more into that. Yeah, and just from a status perspective, uh, uh, the growth management bill has obviously passed, but has not yet been given to the governor for his action um, the governor received seven bills yesterday. He acted upon all seven and signing them. So the bills are starting to flow from the legislature to the governor. He'll get this eventually. Uh, there's a couple hundred bills that he'll have to go through. Uh, this being one of them, I, I have not heard a timeline of when he's going to receive this one. But, but it, the, the, if, if you want to advocate for a particular action on this bill or any other bill by the governor, now is the time. I will add on that as far as advocacy um, and, and just an aside about this governor. He, he's, you know, we knew he wasn't of the sim, typical mold of a Republican ideologue, so to speak. And I don't mean that as a judgment either way. Just kind of, we, we kind of came to think of this is what the Republican statewide candidate looks like. He started pushing for water policy, environmental concerns early on. And as well, you talk about home rule and local control. Last year, he vetoed the bill that, that restricted cities and counties from having plastic straw bans. And his mindset was, this isn't hurting anyone. You may not like the straw ban, but it's not really hurting anyone. I'm going to veto this. As you've watched through this COVID-19 crisis and how he's tried to act, this is a governor who's been very conscious and saying, I don't want to impede on the locals. We've got a large state, both in size and population. I don't want to tell one county they have to do it the same way as another county. And I think, I don't want to get too hopeful on some of these for our local government clients, but I wouldn't be shocked if some of these bills that overreach a little bit too far on some of these local preemptions or, or home rule reach, that he vetoes them under the same ideology of, I've said I'm a local guy, a local control guy, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And he might veto some of these. He did it last year. He's our, and, and he signaled that with a couple bills this year, including the Airbnb bill that didn't pass. He signaled early on that he, he did not like that bill and he'd probably veto it. And as a result, that bill died. So Pay attention to that on some of the bills he passed, he proves and vetoes is if it really reaches into local governments and he doesn't think it's a real issue that they're reaching into for, i.e. it's not really hurting anyone, it's just someone would rather do it a different way, I wouldn't be shocked if he vetoes it. Thank you on that. I, I appreciate that. And before I moved on from that comment, I do want to let it, you know, just if you have questions, and I know we're kind of going a little bit long, are you guys okay with answering one or two more questions? Sure. Okay, uh, and I didn't want to say, she, she had mentioned, Mayor Sladek, if you ha, uh, are interested in calling either of those numbers, they were 850-717-9337 and 850-717-9238. And her comment was, uh, Senate Bill 410 is on the governor's desk in addition to allowing the rural boundary to be breached, it would also require all cities and counties to spend a lot of your money to add language to their planning documents that already exist in Florida's constitution. So it's pointless almost to almost a law to create business and consultants. If you think those pro pro provisions of that law sound like a bad idea, call those numbers 850-717-9337 because these comments will not be on the side when we take this video. Um, so just wanted to let that be known and 
Megan, uh, Mayor Sladek also said that she posted it on her Facebook page also. Before I let you guys go, I want, I want to just make a comment that 501c6s do not have any help as far as these packages. Are, is there, I, I know that the Florida Chamber, the U.S. Chamber, and all chambers are supporting the fact that we want to be in the next package to get support. Do you think that we'll get help? Possibly. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, in, in full disclosure, um, while we do some federal and we certainly we have a D.C. office for Gray Robinson and those folks we, we liaison with a lot, especially these days with the federal packages. We don't do federal day to day. So I'm not talking to rep Congress members or senators on this currently, but I've been talking to our D.C. folks. I've heard obviously what you said is that this is a big push. You're seeing all the chambers rally in the sense that they're going to get y'all are going to get hit just as badly as some of the others. And, and while you're not a C3, you certainly play a vital role in each of these communities um, and should be. So there's certainly an interest there. And, it, and you look at our two Florida senators, Rubio and, and Scott, they're certainly going to be um, of like mind on this. They, they've got lots of ties to our chambers across the state, including all the way up to the top to the Florida chamber. But I, I, I'd be lying if I had a real good read on what the feds are going to do one way or the other. Part of the problem, you'll see, what I've seen just observing and talking to some folks up there is, They've gotten the two trillion dollar package out of the way. They got the healthcare one out of the way. They got the uh, paid sick leave and all that out of the way. So it, the politics are going to rage a little more on this, both on the Republican and Democratic side, where you know both sides are going to dig in a little more. I they want to get their wins for their policy issues because they've kind of done what they think they need to do now that this is all gravy from their perspective. And so I, I anticipate the politics will be ramped up a little more as far as for the Democrats, their priorities, and the same Republicans, which could cause those packages to crater under their own weight. Yeah, and Bridget, I'll, I'll just add on. I, I think I heard you at the very beginning uh, of this uh, program say that you were going to have one of these with uh, Congresswoman Murphy next week. Um, that is exactly the kind of thing that, that you ought to be asking her to help on. Um, the, the next package, is my understanding, is going to originate out of the House. Uh, the Speaker's already working on it, um, and so uh, I think your timing couldn't be better if you wanted to, to ask someone to be an advocate for you. Uh, absolutely. We have already sent her a letter weeks ago, <laughs> and we will continue to advocate for that along with the Florida Chamber, the U.S. Chamber, and at least 93 chambers throughout Florida right now in building. So just so you know, the reason is we are an advocate for our businesses. We will continue to support and push everything we understand that we are a vital service to you guys. And this is what we do. This is what we do. Uh, we make sure that you guys have the resources and uh, have these you know, daily Zoom meetings so that you have these updates. Uh, we wanna make sure that if you have any questions, Gray Robinson here, you, your team is amazing. I saw your update that we did not have and I begged you guys to come on this time. I said, please, Please, I would love to have you next year. So this has been literally a year in the making. Thank you so much for not just having it. Uh, we expected this to be in person, but uh, transitioning and pivoting so quickly to make this a Zoom meeting and making it open to all of our participants. I don't believe that we have any more questions. Uh, Gray Robinson team, Chris Carmody, would you like to wrap it up with any final uh, comments? Yes, certainly. Bridget, it, we really do appreciate you inviting us on. And, and hopefully a year from now, or a little longer, because se next session starts in March, uh, we can all come back and do this in person. Uh, we, we wouldn't miss it. We were proud to put this together and work with you on this. I will say, uh, you'll see on this slide that Robert still has up. Um, I like the tagline, give us your best shot. It's our marketing people that are good at this. Uh, but it has our phone numbers uh, and our emails and our even our Twitter handles, which I encourage you to follow because we try to push stuff out on there. Uh, and, and I promise you, if we have to do it virtually again, even later this summer, if you want to have us back, we'll update those profile pictures to get our real work clothes. Mine's an Orlando Magic t-shirt. I think Dawson's is a festival tank top, and Robert's been wearing a lot of golf stuff. But we'll update that for the next time. But we really do appreciate it for the folks who listened in. If you have additional questions, totally appropriate to email us. We'd love to help you out if we can. Thank you so much. Don't leave us yet. I do have a quick question at the end. I do want to thank Orlando Health South Seminole Hospital for sponsoring. So Chris Carmody, if you were to play a game, a basketball game against anyone, who'd be your, your VIP person? Who, who'd be that person? Like who I'd like to play against? Yeah. 
well, not my teammates because I'm the shortest on the team, but the uh, um, so Muggsy Bogues, I feel like I'd have a good six inches on height wise, but he was pretty athletic. But yeah, I like to play basketball when I can. We don't do that much these days. They took all the hoops out of our neighborhood. So, anyways. Okay, and and Robert, who's who's your team person there? Who would you play against in basketball? Well, uh, as a as a Gator, uh, there's nothing that makes us happier than beating the Seminoles. So, uh, so uh, I would take on a knoll, I guess. <laughs> any any particular knoll that you have in mind? Uh, bring them all. You can take Sam Cassell on Robert. I be, I believe in you. And Chris Dawson, who do you who would you play in basketball one on one? Who do you, who do you think you'd want to play your dream person that you'd want to play in basketball? Bridget, I would play the Monstars from Space Jam because I have been revisiting uh, all the movies of my childhood here in quarantine, so. <laughs> nice, well, I wanna thank all of you so much. Uh, Gray Robinson team here. They are uh, in Twitter at GRLobby, uh, www.grlobby.com. Uh, sorry, www, I'm forgetting my Ws now www.grlobby.com or if you want to call them 800-338-3381. We are here at the Oviedo Winter Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce keeping it live and keeping you updated. So appreciate all of you. One last goodbye from everyone. Thank you so much.